Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me over. Uh, the reason I'm here uh, is a slightly strange one because a few years ago we were uh, we made a TV program uh, connected to the Salme uh, boat burials. So, um, as part of the TV series in England called The Viking Dead, but that was also uh, uh, the fourth in the series of a, t a set of TV, TV programs called Medieval Dead. So, what I want to do today is I want to compare the uh, the boat burials at Sama here to um, to the mass grave that we excavated at Towton in 1996. Uh, so there are two very distinctive and now famous mass graves have been discovered in Europe in the last few decades and as you can see here one is from Estonia at Salme and the other is from England in Towton and that was in 1996. Uh, although the two sets of graves are separated in time by centuries uh, and separated in space by hundreds of uh, miles uh, there are several ways in which we can compare them and they may be seen as slightly similar. Hopefully I'll discuss that as we go along. So basically one of the questions is, can we learn anything from the 26 years uh, that I've had uh, excavating the grave and dealing with the mass grave from town? And does the comparison raise any interesting questions? So hopefully I'll leave that up to you to discuss at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the talk. Just as, a, as an introduction, uh, Towton is, there's the medieval city of York, and Towton is down uh, about 10 miles, 12, 13 k kilometres southwest of York. And as you hopefully know where you are, <laughs> so there's no need to go into great detail about where Salme is in, in Estonia. Uh, the location context of the graves. So at Towton, we know that the burials lay within the consecrated ground of a former chapel, although the chapel is now gone and we don't know exactly where it was. And this was but this was on the edge of the recognised historic battlefield, so we know the context. At Salme, obviously, we know that the ships were buried near to the water on which they presumably sailed, but we know very little of the exact uh, context yet. yet. But was it near to a site of a conflict? And that's one of the questions that a couple of people have raised. Or was it a special piece of ground to those who buried the dead there? Uh, was it the location, uh, was it isolated or heavily populated? And again, we're not sure about that yet. Uh, was it waste ground with nothing around it for miles? Or was it some sort of respected burial ground that we don't know about yet? And again, these are questions that hopefully will be raised as more research gets uh, undertaken. So now we need to talk about the sites at which the conflicts took place. So at Towton, we can be reasonably confident regarding the location of the actual site of the conflict. Uh, these are a collection of 15th century artefacts uh, recovered by metal detectorists over the last 25 years or so. And you can definitely see that there is a concentration in the middle of this area here. So just north of one village, south of Towton itself. And this obviously shows where the medieval conflict took place. Uh, we've even got uh, more than one, we've got several graves, so, uh, two or three mass graves, and also individual graves, which I'll show you as we progress uh, on the battlefield. So we know it's a site of conflict, there's no doubt about that. For some reason that's not working. Oh, there it is. So again, at Salme, uh, it's not known if there is a spread of artefacts or other human remains to indicate where the conflict took place. Um, the historic conflict uh, at Towton, uh, we know who, basically, who the conflict was between. Uh, there were two rival kings on the throne at the time. There was one, King Henry VI of the House of Lancaster, uh, and the up-and-coming King Edward IV of the House of York. And at Towton, Edward was proclaimed king, and so obviously he was the new king. So we know who the, com uh, the combatants, combatants were. It's a bit tricky. Oh, there it is. Woo! All right. So at Town, we even know uh, the names of some of the people that fought there, including some of the images of the people who fought there, which is quite interesting. So we've got Richard Neville, uh, the then Earl of Warwick. So we've got uh, a tomb effigy. 
this one here, uh, which is presumably him in his old, in his later life, otherwise he's not looking very healthy. And then we've got one of his, in his youth, uh, younger days when he's in full armour. Uh, so we know roughly what he looked like. Uh, we've got somebody called Lionel Lord Wells, uh, and we know what he looks like because he, before he died, he made himself a tomb. So presumably this is a very good likeness of what he looked like. Uh, we've got another individual uh, called uh, Radolf Dacre, Lord Dacre, and he's buried in the village to the south of the battlefield. Uh, and here's his uh, tomb with an inscription on it, which basically says that here lies Randolph Lord Dacre, who fought for King Henry VI. In fact, uh, due to the interest that the battlefield has, uh, has uh, collected, uh, we've got some individuals who have been looking through all the historical archives and they've actually got names of, uh, currently it's over 1,200 names of people who actually fought at the Battle of Towton, uh, including this individual, who is uh, Thomas Clifford, 9th Earl Lord Clifford. And he died at the Battle of Towton, but they don't know where his body lies. Uh, we were lucky enough uh, in 2006 to be joined by this gentleman here, who is the current Lord Clifford. And so there is always a potential for matching people who have fought at the battle with potential direct descendants of people who are living today. And we know who they are, so we can include in the Duke of York, etc. So we know these people exist. But because Lord Clifford is missing, you have to at least ask the question, is he one of these? Because they don't know where his grave is. So, so another question for looking at DNA, etc. So in terms of the, historic, conflict, the uh, historic context of the conflicts, in comparison, we can only presently guess who the combatants in the Salma graves might have been. Were they traders or fighters, attackers or defenders? It has already been suggested, however, that they were not originally from Same, but from Sweden, uh, by looking at their body chemistry, for example. But what about their DNA? And obviously, we were going to hear about that uh, today. Is it the next talk or the one after that? No, no, it's later on. Uh, so, uh, again, we can start looking uh, to answer some of the questions. Um, one of the things that's important, what I'm going to discuss now, is the, the, uh, the aspect of commingled human remains. Uh, both sites contain human burials, which are often referred to as mass graves. But in forensic archaeological terms, these are referred to as commingled human remains. The reason being that when one skeleton lies on top of another, uh, the, and they, they deteriorate from two bodies to two skeletons, the bones become mixed. And you have to have the ability to separate those two individuals. Otherwise, it becomes chaos. And then, of course, when you come to analyze the DNA, have you got the right bone from the right individual? So it's important you treat them as individuals all the way through the excavation. So at Salme, we can see that there, uh, there are two boats. Uh, and when you zoom into each one, we can see that there are individuals on each one of the boats. Uh, and when you zoom in even closer, we can see that there are buried human remains, which are separated. So these are individuals. Then we've got some small commingled human remains, such as these three are lying together. So those are commingled. The other two are not. They are separated. And then, of course, you know, uh, You've got the major grave where everybody is commingled. That's incredibly important to separate them as individuals. Otherwise, you can't pick them out and find out individual aspects about them. So at Towton, this is where some of the parallels start to creep in. Here's Towton Hall where we excavated the grave. That's the red one here. This is the bit we'll be looking at. This was excavated by the, by the, um, uh, the builders sometime before we even got there, so we don't have that bit of the grave. So we're looking at this bit here, uh, and later on we'll be looking at those. So here's uh, a close-up of all these individuals in the corner of Towton Hall. So if we're going closer, we can see that once again we've got uh, individual burials, 
which are not commingled. Then we've got triple burials, which are commingled. So coincidentally, we have three burials on top of each other that are commingled, exactly the same as at Salome. And obviously we have the mass grave uh, of the collection of most of the individuals. So in terms of artefacts, Towton is a little bit embarrassing compared to Salme because <laughs> that's it. Uh, so we have one finger ring on the one individual and this was almost certainly missed by accident because this is made of silver and everything was stripped from the graves from everyone else apart from uh, inside what we presume some of these might have been actually pushed into the wounds of the individuals because again these were left behind as well and these are the copper alloy uh, lace ends which would have looked something similar to this it's to help you thread lace when you're uh, putting your clothing on and the only other aspect was this which is a piece of a broken uh, bone with copper alloy rivets in it and again, it's paralleled with something like that. So that's what it would have looked like. And that's all there was. Uh, I'm not even going to go into the artifact <laughs> density from Salome because obviously we know all about it and it's, it's immense from everything from the pieces of swords to the ship rivets and the gaming pieces. But if you compare these to other collections of artifacts from the same period, we can see that there are some similarities. Here we see the, uh, the um, Staffordshire Hoard from England, and it's from approximately right, the right period. Now, this, is just, this has just been finished uh, to be collated, and they now know that all these artefacts are weapon-related, or, sorry, conflict-related, including the processional cross, which has been bent up, and I think it's even there. That may be a piece of it. Uh, so all these artefacts would have been or could have been present on the battlefield. And what's interesting, there aren't anything else. So there aren't any other artefacts that would be associated with a collection of grave goods. For example, like at Sutton Who, where you get dishes and bowls and other artefacts and ivory combs or whatever. There are none in the Staffordshire hoard. And that's very interesting. So they are presuming at the moment that somehow this is conflict related so somebody's collected all these artifacts together and decided to put them together and rebury them in a hoard in terms of the evidence of the conflict uh the, at Towton we've got an abundance of uh, weapon trauma uh, extensive uh, from the wounds a uh, different uh, variety of weapons from uh, swords knives axes hammers and arrows so first look at the uh, evidence of blade wounds. As we can see, it's quite extensive. So you get complete uh, sword blows bisecting the face. And then you get sword blows to the back of the head. So it takes the back of the head off. And these are for almost from, uh, certainly from swords, axes possibly, but more likely swords. So they're very sharp. Uh, individuals that have been chopped from behind into the back of the head. Looks like he's got his sword jammed a bit because he's rattled it a bit to get it out. Sorry, it's a bit gruesome, but that's the way it is. And then you get these other individuals. This individual had at least 14 blows to the head, uh, including sword blows, knife blows, stab wounds and knife cuts. So this poor chap did not want to go down quietly, obviously. And then we've got evidence from uh, what's called blunt force trauma. So that is something like a war hammer or a mace. And if you swing this in, with enough force into the skull, it makes a very nice um, uh, specific type of uh, injury. And sometimes they're not just round, but they're rectangular. So you can actually see the shape of the weapon that made uh, that particular blow. Uh, we've got individuals like this from number 16 from Towton and there is evidence that he has uh, fought before and survived and healed and this is in the medieval period so this is fantastic healing without severe infection uh, and we had a reconstruction made for him uh, and that's what presumably what he looked like uh, when, when he went into battle for the second and last time. Uh, we've got evidence of piercing wounds, so uh, something that would go straight in and straight out again with a very sharp piercing wound, including some uh, knife wounds, stab wounds, or potentially arrowhead wounds. 
And we know, and this is a, an important point to make, that although these wounds are extensive and quite severe, a lot of these you can survive. And there are examples from around the world now, unfortunately, places like Rwanda, where people have survived machete wounds it's right inside the head, like some of these individuals. So we cannot automatically assume that all these people die straight away. It's an important point to make. And we've even got an individual, this chap, poor chap, uh, I don't even see it there, but if you highlight it, it looks like somebody's chopped his ear off because he's got cut marks as though somebody has been sawing his ear off with a knife. Uh, and unfortunately, this is also common in multiple periods where people are taking trophies, which is not very nice. So here's a collection of all the wounds uh, from the Tatton individuals. And you can see it's quite extensive. Now, if we look at the evidence from Salme again, um, it's very similar. We've got similar wounds, especially defensive wounds to the hand where somebody would do that and somebody would attack somebody with a sword. They've got the same sort of wounds on the skull. And again, I'm not going to go into that because other people will be talking about it. Um, so this is, I think this is quite interesting because we've got, we've got to look at the shape of the grave. So here we know, we now know that this is a ship and we know that there are two ships or boats. Uh, and we know the shape of this because of the, not only the ship rivets, but of the individuals who were inside. And we know that they were in a concaved uh, hole in the ground, which reflects the shape of the ship. And we could argue that the, uh, it's the fact that the rivets are present here, these lines of rivets, that you can prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that this is a ship. But, and that's what it looks like in plan, obviously. There's no doubt that this is a ship. But at Towton, we've got something very similar. We've got a long, thin uh, structure, which is elongated in shape. And if you look at the sections, both longitudinally and across ways, you can see that they have a similar shape. And this is cut into sand and gravel, just like at Salme, except we don't have ship rivets. Otherwise, it looks very similar. So is that a ship? And if not, why are they burying it in a shape of a grave like that? Well, if you look at, the, if you zoom out with a drone or something or with an aerial photograph, you can see that the landscape is full of these lines of ridge and furrow medieval uh, field uh, systems. And if you look at those in detail, you see that is the cross section. And if you put the grave in, they fit perfectly. And that's almost certainly what's happened at Tatton. They've been buried into uh, a part of a medieval field system uh, as, a, a, as an easy way of digging a, a grave. And that's important because I think they were trying to save time and energy. So what about dating the human remains? Well, we know from Tatton, obviously, I can tell... Uh, I can be incredibly confident that these chaps at Towton died on the afternoon of the 29th of March in 1461. And I don't think you can actually get better than that <laughs> in terms of dating. And we know that, and it's been confirmed by the radiocarbon dates, and every time we look at it, it produces the same information. So in comparison, this is where we've got one up on the Salme grave because, of course, uh, we're still struggling to note exactly when it was, the context that it was in. Uh, so the dating is still approximately about 750. Uh, the difference in dating accuracy, therefore, ranges from within, to within a few hours to simply within a few centuries. Uh, so one up to Towton, I think, there. So... <laughs> Uh, this highlights the importance of the informational uh, information of contextual historical information. If you haven't got any, you're just stuck. You rely on other things, and we are very lucky at Town. Uh, so, for at Salme, for example, there currently is nothing that, as far as I know, uh, that ties it into a, a known event. So, one important aspect of the comparison is that related to how the people were buried and what this might signify. This is the point of the, uh, one of the points of the talk. So at Salme 1, the human remains appear to be in mixed orientation or more randomly placed, some supine, which is face up, and some prone, which is face down. Uh, were these of lower status? 
or was the same care shown to the individuals in Psalm 2? So you look in Psalm 2, it's more regular. Uh, the human remains appear to be more regularly spaced and all with associated grave goods. Uh, they lie orientated uh, northwest, south, northeast, southwest, and northwest, southeast. So at Towton, there are three distinct orientations of the skeletal material in, in the mass grave. Uh, we've got from west east, which is a standard Christian way of burying, face up. We've got west east, which is exactly the opposite, uh, could be face up. Uh, we've got north south. This is the only individual that's uh, facing north south. And I think they did. They put this chap there because there was a space at the end of the grave. I think they just had a space and they had some individuals to put in it, so they filled the space up. You'll see why in a minute. And then there's obviously the prone, so there's face up, and then there's, uh, sorry, face down, and then the supine face up. Uh, and if you look at the context of how these individuals are buried, there is, even though they started off uh, west-east, in the Christian manner. Some were face up and some were face down. So there's no respect shown here. It's just that it seemed to be a way of filling a grave. And they seem to have started with some sort of intention then it all went pear-shaped at the end. And I'll show you now why uh, we believe this. And there they all are together. So what I'll do now is I'll run through a sequence very quickly of all these individuals and you'll see how they were buried. And now they start turning around. So one interpretation that I prefer is that the, is of this process relates to the filling of the grave pits as efficiently as possible. And this process does not infer respect for the dead at all. It's just a way of filling a hole in the most efficient way. So now if we look at the Town Hall itself, and the north, uh, the north east corner, we can see the whole group of individuals we've been talking about. And now I can in talk about the individuals very quickly. So we've got one individual who was half under the wall of the house. We've got another individual who was under the wall of the house, but they were buried in the Christian manner. And then we've got another individual buried inside underneath the dining room of the house. Uh, and then we've got the triple graves of the three individuals, uh, on, again, underneath the dining room of the house. And we... Uh, at the moment, we are tending to believe that these three chaps, sorry, four chaps, and maybe one or two in there, may possibly be related. And I was hoping to get the DNA results back, and they're not back yet, so I can't tell you <laughs> if they are or not. So that's work in progress. And we can tell by the contextual uh, looking at that part of the grave that all these individuals, even the ones underneath the dining room, they're all date to a period before the house was built, Town Hall was built. So all these individuals, individuals were not deliberately buried with artefacts. Apart from that one finger ring, there are no artefacts there at all. So in terms of respect, uh, at Towton, the Christian site, less respect was shown to those buried in the mass grave and more respect was shown to those in the individual or smaller graves. Alternatively, alternatively, it's Salme, the non-Christian site, more respect appears to be shown in the people in the mass grave. The larger and possibly less respect was shown in the smaller grave. And this seems to be sort of balanced by the grave goods to a certain degree. They seem to be higher status in the bigger grave. So might these differences infer a hierarchy between those who were interred? And was regulated mass burial more acceptable or even preferable to individual buried for the people at Salme? If you want to be buried after a big barney, a big fight, and you're going to Valhalla, do you want to be there on your own? Or do you want to go with all your mates you go down the pub with? So it's an interesting concept. Do we, do we, can we have, uh, can we infer anything from this? So did the burial party at Town only respect the dead in the individual graves? And this goes with the Christian way of burying people. So were they buried with, by the victors or simply by the people they left behind to clear the dead? Was the mass grave at Town filled with their enemies or simply of the people of a lower status? At Town, 
it is more difficult to interpret the mains than at Salme because of the grave goods and everything else that goes with it. The mass graves at Salme are very unusual. That's beyond a doubt. It can be argued that the people at the grave too were buried with a great deal of respect, care and respect. Time was taken to lay out each individual and it's also a, con a, a potential that if you lay these individuals out in a set manner and you want to keep that uh, level of respect maintained, you can't go and bury under other people on top of them without disturbing the ones below. So I believe that one of the reasons we could interpret this layers of sand is they did it deliberately so that the people that were buried just after them or later or whatever, uh, they were not disturbed by the people who were burying the subsequent burials. Each individual was buried associated with grave goods, suggesting they were not rushed or they, or they didn't need to flee. They were given time and respect uh, to these individuals. The people appear to have been buried by their friends and not their enemies. We can't say this for certain, but it's highly probable. And boats were also buried, suggested that if the survivors were not locals, then other boats were available in which to return home if that was necessary. So, summary, losers or victors. Following the most, most battles, the victors loot the battlefield for any items of value. They hold the battlefield, usually for at least a day and a night, in order to do this. Like the artefacts found at the Staffordshire Horde, for example. Somebody's collected them off a battlefield and moved them away and reburied them. If the people found at Salme Graves had lost the battle, then why was there so many artefacts buried with them, including an excess of swords and at least two ships? Oh, wrong one. Why was so much time and care spent preparing the grave, the ships, the setting out of the dead, if the, victor if the victorious enemy was still nearby in order to threaten them? It's very unlikely. Were those buried in Salme only possible simply because they were, they were the victors of the conflict? Did the remaining combatants hold the field, clear any valuable artefacts and then bury their own dead with great ceremony and respect? If this is true, then the battlefield in which they fought might be very close by. Is it? Will future discoveries of artefacts or other human remains locate a potential site of conflict either on land or on the seabed or in the riverbed nearby. And this has just been undertaken over the last few years, the last decade or so, at uh, a site in uh, Gotland, at the Battle of Masterby, where uh, Maria Lingstrom has discovered the site of the Battle of Masterby. Uh, and you see by this extensive series of uh, artefacts, most of which are arrowheads and fragments of weapons and battle-related furniture, it's definitely the site of a medieval battle. So, different mass graves from around the world. There are extensive numbers of mass graves uh, and very, very few have artefacts associated with them or especially valuable artefacts associated with them. So at Salme, we have a bit of everything. And that's why I think the site at Salme is unique. And as I've got one minute to go, that's not bad. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. You will also be awarded with the uh, board game. Mm -hmm. um, we um, uh, do have uh, time for a quick question, if anybody has one. But I would like to comment that your point that the layer of uh, sand that was put on top of uh, the um, third layer of uh, burials uh, in order to actually bury the fourth la uh, the most topmost uh, uh, layer is a good idea in the sense that if you carry a grown man and you have to step on swords and other dead people, it would be very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um. Oh, wait. Um. I just call up to be careful when you, when you talk about uh, showing respect. Uh, because uh, 
uh, according to your culture or our culture, it seems individuality is respect. When it takes a local culture, collectivity is respect. Mm. Because all, all our graves are what you call mass graves. Mm. So it probably was the most respectful way to bury someone, to bury someone in a collective grave. So we can't decide it. So uh, if they take it like this, then actually the first boat, where the burial custom was very local, was more respect, at least from the side of the locals, than the other one. We don't know. Yeah. So Yuri Holden. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Et uh, esimene laev, kus oli seitses olnud, et pigem see istuvas matus, see on fiktsioon. Et tegelikult mõetad samamoodi üksese kõrval, see on sama, no ka mitte tõeselt, aga tõenäolisem kui see, et nad on niimoodi segamine mõetad. Ja samamoodi on nüüd ilmselt olnud relvi kaasas, aga mitmekordsete kaevamiseks on täielikult selle asja lõhkunud, väljavalt kolm luustiku, mis on paika jäänud, torsa osa, mis on paika jäänud on ju üle jäänud lõhutud. Nii et tegelikult minu arvates on küll ka esimene laeval samasugu respektiga mõetud, aga miks nad eraldi mõetud on, see on ise küsimus. Ja see antud juhu ei puutu mõssaudada. Ja siis nüüd see kollektiivsus ja mitte kollektiivsus, no see nüüd on väga kesitab sellepärast, et mõetud ei olnud kindlasti kohalikud. Ja. No. ja miks pidi mõetama neid siis võõramõistse tabada järgi? Ja nüüd Maarika pas ka väga hästi teadma, et skandinaalvasti kombeks oli matta üks saaval ja kõrgete käepaste alla. Nii hoida. That uh, the ones who buried were, were local. Or at least it was people who cooperated with locals. So that uh, the local features are absolutely obvious in these burials. <laughs> Aga jah, nii. Vaata, Marika, asi on nüüd selles, et sinule surnumajad, kus sa mõeta kollektiivselt ja pikka aja jooksul, on surnud, sa ise oled veid, noh, ka seda on surnud ja luud kõik segamani paisatud. Aga seal meil on nad kõik väga korrektsed ja väga korralikult mõetud. Mõlemas laevas tunduvad olevat. Nii et ma ei näe küll põhjus seda nüüd pidada kohalikus matmiskombestikus, vaid see lihtsalt on lahing välja matus, nagu nüüd on niimoodi olnud ja ta on tõesti unikaalne, sest sellist ei ole kuskil mujal, kus on selline mass matus, kus on koos relvade asjadega, mis on ja tõsi erinevad perioodidest, nagu Viljam juttu tuleb, aga sellel on juba mingi teine seletus. Ja. Uh, I think I comment it later because I want to uh, throw some summary of this uh, treatment of these burials because right now as well, so the first grave was not in a good order, but we suggest that it was because we like to believe it. So that uh, uh, I think we take it, this discussion up later because we have planned it a little bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. We will uh, definitely have uh, time to uh, to go into more uh, detail uh, later on. Now, uh, thank you, Tim.